What a day, great day in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody told me it's his first day of fall this week. I said, I'm, I think Houston missed it, but that's all right. It's just kind of, it's the way I like it right here and right now. Just leave it year round like this for me. It'd be just good with me. It's good to see you today. I hope you are still kind of warmed up still, right? Yep. Nobody's chilling here, are they? We don't want to do that. Uh, you, we've been in this series against all odds, and today I want to talk about, in the context of this, of facing failure. These passages of Scripture we've looked at have been uh, uniquely dealing with about every kind of uh, situation we can get into where it looks like there's, there's no answer or there's no victory or there's no hope or there's no way out. I mean, we've dealt with a, a lot of different scenarios uh, from you know, judges of Israel to David to Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. We looked at all these different things. And each one of them has something that's unique to that particular passage. And it's a unique situation. And I want to deal with that today as well. We're going to be looking in the book of uh, Joshua. A lot of people think when you go to Joshua, if you're talking about against all odds, it would be Jericho. Because they were against all odds and it's how you're going to conquer this city. But that's not where I want to go. In fact, I want to go just beyond that. The next battle that they faced was at Ai. If you're familiar with the passage, you're familiar with that story, you can open your Bibles up to Joshua chapter 8. And you'll see how this story begins to unfold. And most of the scriptures I'll just read to you from the text are not necessarily on the board today, but they are important passages. But kind of, let me give you the background story. You remember the story of Jericho, the walls fell, it's victory. Everything was wonderful, everybody's celebrating. But remember that the Lord had told the children of Israel, when you win this battle at Jericho, make sure that you don't take anything. Everything stays here. In fact, if you touch anything and take anything from this city, it will be a curse to you. So you leave everything here, don't touch anything. On the other hand, just as well, I don't want you to touch anything here. I want you to know the rest of the land is yours. Every city, every village, every cow, every sheep, every dollar, every piece of gold, every piece of silver, every garment. You know, it's all yours. The whole land is yours. Everything in the land is flowing with milk and honey. It belongs to you. You can have every part of it. But I want you to leave Jericho alone. People say, well, why is that? Because it's the first fruits. In fact, when it talks later about the man who took some things that he shouldn't from Jericho, remember Achan? He took a Babylonian uh, garment and some silver and some gold and he hid them in his tent. The Bible refers to those as accursed things. In other words, they were things that he shouldn't have touched. Literally, they are, what, what is accursed in Scripture is those things that belong to the Lord in that context. Jericho was a first fruits offering of the land to the Lord. A lot of people don't understand the first fruits concept, but really it's a concept that was introduced well before the tithe was ever instituted. It's that issue that's dealt with in the book of Genesis when you see Cain and Abel, you know, they're bringing offerings and they're supposed to be bringing first fruits offerings. So it's an offering that must have been thoroughly understood by Adam and Eve. It's an offering to the Lord of the, of the best and the first of what we have. It goes to God. Well, unfortunately, Jericho was to be first fruits, but and the unfortunate part of it is that Achan refused that message. And when he got into the midst of the battle and is walking through the rubble, he sees some stuff I want. So he takes it. Nobody knows about it but him. And he hides it in his tent. The next battle they face is a place called Ai. Not near as formidable as Jericho. Should have been easy in, easy out, get it done, wipe it out. And we're on the road to the next deal. But they don't. In fact, I think 35 men, I think the story says, were lost their lives in that battle. Children of Israel only sent out a small contingent. There were two things that caused them to lose that battle at Ai. One was pride and the other was the greed of Achan caused them to lose that. God's blessing was not upon them when they went. But many times, this is just the way it is in our life. We, we rebel against the Lord in some place in our heart and life. We don't do what God told us to do or we do what we shouldn't do, all right? And we just, we just disobey God. And because God has blessed us in the past, we just think God's going to bless us in the future, no matter what we're doing or how we're living. Well, this serves as a, as a very good illustration of that is not true. You know, you, you walk with the Lord daily. It, it's a daily commitment. What happened yesterday is yesterday, you know. What happens today is, is should be committed to the Lord. It should be surrendered to Christ. He's, you know, we serve the Lord on a daily walk in the journey that we're on. Well, these people weren't getting that particular understanding of the whole passage. And now they are facing defeat. 
they're broken, they're wondering what's going on, they can't understand the, the loss, and, and so many of them at least, and they're facing this place where, hey, that was a failure. You know, now what are we going to do? We blew that deal. Now what? What are we going to do? And this is important, a very important lesson because every one of us, without fail, including me and you, we all get to the point in our lives where there are failures. And how we handle those failures and what we do with our failure tells a lot about our character. If we refuse to move forward and we get paralyzed with fear or with doubts or discouragement, then we're certainly going to miss the blessings of God on our life. Just because you failed, listen carefully, just because you failed doesn't mean that God failed. And just because you failed doesn't mean God's done with you. You ought to praise the Lord on that one. Amen. Amen. Knowing that God is still up to something. It was a famous theologian uh, by the name of F.W. Robertson who made this statement. He said, life like war is a series of mistakes. And he is not the best Christian nor the best general who makes the fewest false steps. Poor mediocrity can secure that. But his is the best who wins the most splendid victories by retrieval of mistakes. Forget mistakes now. Organize victories out of mistakes. Too many people never get to this place. They just live in their mistake. They live in their failure. It's kind of like, well, I blew that. What's the use? Or it's not going to work now. Or it's not going to, it's not going to turn out right. And they just miss the, the, what God has for them. And they live that life of just mediocrity. And they don't experience what God has for them. You know, it's one thing, you know, to, to make a commitment to Christ, to surrender your heart and life to Christ and go on and walk in victory for a while, then to only blow it. All right. And blow it bad. Nobody I'm sure here has done that, right? Everyone in this room has experienced that if we'd be honest. Times of just miserable failure. Just times of, I did the wrong thing. That was bad. That was stupid. I knew what God wanted. I, did, I didn't do what God wanted. And now I'm living in my own little sphere of misery and despair and defeat. And my life's a mess. Is there any hope? Because it doesn't look like there is. In fact, I'm standing here looking at the situation. It seems like this is another one of those against all odds. But what have we discovered in five weeks of against all odds? There ain't no such thing when the, when the devil is a sure deal. It's only with God. And we can overcome and we can be victorious, but decisions are going to have to be made. Please understand today, no matter what the failure's been, no matter how far the fall has come, God's not done. God's not over, not by a long shot. And you may be feeling kind of, well, yeah, well I, 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 I blew that, so I'll, I'm, God's not... God's not going to use me or God's not going to work in me or that didn't work out. Now I've got a, a bad testimony and now nobody's going to, oh, whatever, whatever that junk is, you need to realize today as we talk about this passage that we are, this is not the end, it's the beginning. It's a new beginning, but nonetheless, you start, you have to get up. You have to start. You, it's the same as when you started the first time or the seventh time. It's a matter of facing what's been done and being honest with God and owning up to the failure, but not staying in the failure, but moving on. It starts with a new beginning. And that's where they are in Joshua chapter eight. If you have your Bible open, verse one says, now the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear, don't be afraid, nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise and go up to Ai and see that I have given the king of Ai and in, in, in his people and the city and his land. Now, two words are right there that you've got to pay a little bit of attention to. Remember where they're at. They're in failure, miserable failure. And it's cost people their lives, their family, their brothers, their sisters. People have died from this bad, stupid deal. And it goes and they've dealt with Achan now. Remember, He's, he, 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 he blew it. And that's been dealt with. It's all been, it's all been taken care of now. And now we're at the point of a new beginning. And here's two things the Lord reminds them of. And you see this over and over and over again in scripture. He says, do not fear and do not be dismayed. How often, I hadn't, didn't even run it to my concordance, but if you look those two words up, how many times they appear in scripture together is phenomenal. Don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. Fear, that word has to do with that unsettled, I'm kind of afraid of this situation or I'm frightened by something and, it's, and, and it's, it's hindering me. I'm not moving forward because this fear remains in my heart. And, and it really gets down to this, it, 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 it boils down to unbelief, but it's, it's still an emotional reality and it's still a physical reality that fear may inhabit my heart. And perhaps it's because of the failure. 
but fear. The second word he uses, don't be dismayed. And that is a word which has to do with just the opposite of encouragement. It means don't be discouraged. Don't, don't let these things sap you. Don't let these things steal or rob you of the joy that is supposed to be yours or the passion that God has for you. And it it's also translates to be shattered. And in other places, translated broken down. Don't be afraid and don't be shattered. Don't be broken down. It has to do with, with, with two important things in, that we deal with even in our Christian life. You know, and the answer to both those things, fear and discouragement, it really gets back to hearing and believing what God is saying. And here God says, there's no need to be afraid now. But Lord, we lost. People died. It was a failure. Do not be afraid. But Lord, we just don't have, we just don't have, the, we don't have the courage to get up and, and do not be dismayed. Now, will I hear that? Secondarily, will I believe that? Will I move out against my own doubts, my own discouragement, my own fears, my own intrepidations, and will I move forward? This is, what, this is the word of the Lord. And it's not the first time that God has shared these particular words with, with, with the people of God. It's the same words that Joshua heard Moses speak about 40 years before this at a place called Kadesh Barnea when the 12 spies were sent out. And the words that were spoken then in Deuteronomy, it says there, see the Lord God has placed this land before you. These are Joshua's words here. He's saying them, take up the possession as the Lord has given it to you. And as the Lord has spoken to you, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Now the words just reiterating the same words he'd said before 40 years earlier. Moses also spoke to Joshua before he dies, before the children of Israel go into the land. 40 years later, listen to the words in Deuteronomy 31. And the Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Those are powerful words. And I would say to you the very same thing, no matter what you're dealing with, how far you may have fallen or what the discouragement might be or what the failure might be, the same words. The Lord is with you. Get right with him. Get your heart right with him. He goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. You have got to embrace those promises from God. And you have to believe those promises from God. Those words again were spoken by Joshua after he goes into the promised land. And the Lord speaks and the Lord says to Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong. Be of good courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Okay, Josh, you ought to get the message by now. All right. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Why shouldn't I be afraid? Why should I not be discouraged? Because the Lord is with you. Two things. He won't fail you. He won't forsake you. Well, I think the Lord failed me. Hey, let's take an inventory. Who failed? God didn't fail you. You failed him. Why? Why do you say that, Pastor? How can you know that? Because God doesn't fail. It's not on his M.O., it's not part of his character. It's not part of who he is. He is the ultimate victor. He always wins. Even in your failure, you can find victory. But it starts with the courage and the faith and the fortitude to be woman enough or man enough to say, hey, it's time for a fresh start. It's time for a new beginning. That was pretty wimpy praise, wasn't it? Go ahead and praise the Lord the way you should. He gives, he gives a couple of words here. One I want you to catch from this, this, this new beginning is there is a word of instruction, all right? God says to them, you know, in the process of don't be afraid, the Lord is with you. And here's that verse where in verse two, he goes on and talks about this. Uh, God, God's got this thing all laid out. God's got a plan. You just need to be not discouraged now. You need to be encouraged. And what encourages you is hearing what God has to say to you. Too many times it's, we're not willing to hear what God says. We're still listening to the to the flesh and we're still listening to the devil. And you know what he's, he's all about. He's always about discouragement. But not only is this a word of encouragement, he gives, it is a word of promise, all right? God has a plan for you to follow. Now, you'll see if you read through the whole chapter, 
that God gives them a very clear plan to follow. But part of this new beginning is being willing to hear what God says, be willing to trust what he says, receive the encouragement, but also receive the instruction as it's given. There's this, there's this word of instruction that's given a part of it, but it's also a word of promise. God said it, that kind of settles the whole deal. All right, AI is going to fall. How do you know that? It didn't last time. You didn't do what God said. In fact, if you follow the story, again, you go back and you see Achan's disobedience by taking things from Jericho that he should have never touched. And you see Joshua's leadership is poor here because he doesn't seek the face of God. He doesn't get instruction. He got instruction on Jericho. Remember, he had very clear instruction, didn't he? But with AI, oh, how's it look? Eh, it's not too big a play. Well, send, 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 send 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, whatever. Send those guys up. They'll take care of it. No prayer, no consideration, no humility, no what are we going to do, how are we going to handle this? And it just misses it completely and they fail in the whole process. But here's the beauty of the lesson. Don't miss this. No matter how badly we do fail, we can get up. We can come to the Lord. We can start. We can begin again. Praise God that he is the God of fresh new beginnings. Or we'd all be sunk. So he says, I'm going to take this place of disaster in your life and turn it to defeat. Now, let me just say this. Obviously, if you don't realize you're in a disaster, you're pretty defeated. Amen. You got to realize where you are. You got to realize you are where you're at, why you're at. The pride, the greed, whatever it might be in your case, the failure to believe God, whatever it is. You got to be willing, again, to have the moral fortitude to come and say, I need to trust God and I need to move forward. I need to be what God wants me to be. So that's the new beginning. But as I said here, there's this word of instruction, this word of promise. God gives them a clear, brand new strategy. It's a new situation. It's not Jericho. That was yesterday. This is AI today. We need to know what God wants to do with my life today. I need to know how to handle this situation today. I approached it the wrong way and I ended up in the wrong place. So I need to change my strategy. I need to change how I approach this ordeal. If I keep doing the same thing over and over again, I'm going to keep having the same results over and over again. Some of you are in cyclical messes. You just keep cycling around and around. And you keep coming around the same thing because you keep doing the same thing, making the same bad choice, doing the same stupid thing. And every time I do the same stupid thing, I end up in the same stupid place. Amen. So something has to change. And we have to, at this point, be willing to say, God, okay, it's important that I seek you. What do you want to do in this situation? Obviously, you don't want me to depend on what happened at Jericho. That was nice and we celebrated. But look where that, you know, ultimately we, we did that all wrong. I think maturity, people who really want to go on with the Lord, people who are serious about being a leader in their family, their home, or their own life, exercising spiritual discipline in their life. You have to get to this very important part about strategizing in your spiritual life. We are in a battle. This is a war. It may not be AI, but it can be just as devastating as a loss there. Do you know that the word strategy comes from two Greek words, which mean to lead an army? That's what the word strategy means. You have to survey the situation. Well, how do we do that? Well, one is Christians, we pray. We have to talk to the Father about this. We've got to get with God on this. How did they, how did they overcome at Jericho? Joshua got with God and got the plan and he told the plan to his men and they fulfilled it all but one disobedient person. And the walls of Jericho fell. But that's not how he tells them to go up and capture Ai. You're thinking, all right, Joshua's probably thinking, okay, I'm, okay, 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 I'm gonna talk to the Lord about this and I know what he's gonna say. Been here, done this. I'm gonna have to go around, got everybody out. We're gonna march around the city seven times, once each day for six days, seventh time. We're gonna march around seven times on the seventh day, blow the horn, shout, the people shout. No, God didn't tell them to do that at all. So if you're trying to use a strategy from an old battle on your situation today, it's not going to work. You got to get with God. You got to get honest with God and say, God, what am I going to do? What do you want me to do? Where do I head out? I, I, where I've gotten is, is this point of discouragement and failure in my life. I got here without your instruction. I didn't need any help to get in a mess. 
But I need your help to get moved on to a place of victory in my life. And genuine leadership, genuine spirituality demands praying. And I believe in the context of praying with God's word, it has to do with planning and it has to do with strategy. And I believe that's such an important part that's left out of most people's personal spiritual battles. And they keep approaching their temptation or their trial or their situation the same way every time and ending up defeated every time. Who was it that said, you know, that the definition of his insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results? Well, that's certainly a soul insanity or spiritual insanity. Now, if, if you like strategies and you want to see a little bit more about this story, I'll give you a little brief insight, but I encourage you to read this later on. It's brilliant military strategy. It's not at all, you know, like, like it was at Jericho. The Lord breaks them in this, for, for the capture of Ai. There's this genius plan. It doesn't come from Joshua. It comes from the Lord. And the Lord says, here's what I want you to do. You went here. They came out. They conquered you before. Here's what we're going to do. And what he does, the, what got Israel in pr- trouble was what ultimately was their pride What's going to win this victory now in AI is going to be AI's pride. And God's going to use that. And he develops this, strand, this particular strategy. He get, breaks them into three different contingents of soldiers. The first group of, of the, he called them the valiant warriors. They were to march at night and go to the west side of the city. They're camped out by Gilgal. It's a long mark, all right? So he sends them out by night. And they, they're, they're hiding on the west side in the rocks and the rubble of, of the mountains that that surround that that part of the the community. Their assignment was at a certain point of the battle, they're going to rush into the city and they're going to burn it. And they're going to be able to do that because there's another contingent that's going to draw the warriors out of the city. That's, that's, That's the second group. It's mentioned in chapter eight as well, around verses 10 or 11. This is really an army and they have to walk 15 miles as well. And early in the morning, they camp out in plain sight of, the, of the, the watches of Ai. So here's, you know, all these 30,000 men over here, they're hiding out. And then you got another group, you know, uh, uh, the first group is 30,000. The next group is, is a large contingency of thousands of soldiers and they're pa- parked out in plain sight, all right? And they're led by Joshua, but there's another contingent of soldiers that is parked between a little place called Bethel and Ai. Bethel was kind of a sister city to Ai, and when there was trouble, they would send their warriors to battle. So the Lord parks about five or 6,000 men between those two communities. They serve a purpose for stopping any reinforcements, and also at a certain point in the battle, taking out the, the back quarters of the soldiers of Ai. Here's the way the plan unfolds, and it's, you know, it, it all has to do, the strategy was that, Joshua, you're going to take this group out, and you're going to act like you're getting ready to storm the city, and the soldiers of Ai, they're going to see you, and they're going to come out to meet you in battle, and as soon as they get out to the battle line, turn and run like you're the biggest cowards of around. And sure enough, they get out to battle, Joshua's men, boom, and start running. As they do, Ai empties, all the soldiers in the city empty out. Joshua gives the signal, raises his javelin, the 30,000 men rush into the city, destroy it, while the other 5,000 are coming to take up the rear quarters, and the other 30,000, once the city's destroyed, take out the last quarter. They kill everybody. They destroy the city. The king of Ai, Ai is hung on a tree throughout the whole day. The end of the day, he's laying down in a big heap in the city gate, and he's piled heap high full of rocks. He stands there to show the judgment of God upon the people of God who disobey God or any people who disobey God. A lot of people, they read through the Canaanites and all that stuff. They, well, God's a cruel God. He's a bloody God. And he destroyed all those people. Listen, all those people, if you study history and biblical history, had a chance and an opportunity to repent and to trust God, but they kept rejecting God and pursuing their pagan deities and their pagan gods. It's not going to be any different at the end of times, folks, when judgment will fall upon the whole earth. All right. And all unrighteousness will be judged. That's why I tell folks all the time, it's best to get on board now with Jesus (laughs) because condemnation is coming one way or the other. It may be here on the earth. Ultimately will be in hell for everybody that rejects the Lord. So the strategy is given to the people of God. They fulfill it and a victory takes place. When you read through the the chapters 14 towards the end of the chapter after this new strategy, you'll see that that a victory was given. The city's emptied out. 
the soldiers are destroyed. And it was their own arrogance. They went out, how oh, we got this. It was Matthew Henry who said, you know, they are in most danger who are least aware of it. Well, what a great quote, is it not? They are in most danger who are least aware of it. Some people have no idea. They're so full of themselves, they think they've got a grip on life. They think they've got a grip on God. They got a grip on the world. They're all together. They think they know everything. Nobody can tell them anything. They can't be taught. They can't be led. They're just, you know, I, I, the, the universe revolves around me. They are in most danger who are least aware of the danger. And what happens? The world collapses in on them. AI is captured in verses 18 and 20. AI's army and people are destroyed in verses 21 through 29. AI's king is slain in verse 23 and 29 he's laid at the gate. The final gesture of the victory is the, you know, the king is killed. That's the head. And this is so important in our spiritual lessons in life, folks. Jesus, how can you bind the strong man and spoil his goods? In other words, you have to, if you're going to take the strong man's house and spoil his goods, you have to deal with the strong man. And this is where a lot of Christians don't understand the concept of, of dealing with, with spiritual principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness. You have an ultimate enemy and his name is Satan. And he'll do everything he can to destroy your life. We all, you know, we, we all get to this place in our life, we start realizing, hey, there's bad stuff in my life, so what I need to do is I, I need to be a better person. And this is where we miss God if we're not careful. This is where we end up with religion versus a real relationship with Christ. We think that being a Christian is, you know, we're like a fruit tree and we got all this bad fruit hanging off our life. We're gonna go in and start chopping off that bad fruit, that's bad fruit, that's, well, folks, let me tell you, the whole tree's bad. You got bad fruits because you got bad roots. Bad roots produce bad fruits. So what has to happen? You have to deal with the whole issue of your life. My life has to be placed in Jesus' hands. All right? If I'm not willing to place my life in Jesus' hands, then all I'm going to be is just religious at best. And I'm going to miss a walk with God. I'm going to miss a relationship with Christ. I'm going to miss the joy of the Spirit and the fellowship of the Spirit in my life. And so you're always chopping stuff off. and think, well, that looks better. And it pops up over here again. I thought I dealt with that. Got to change the root structure. In the book of Revelation, it calls Jesus the root. So our, our roots need to be sunk into Jesus thoroughly and firmly and then produce fruit that's genuine and real and righteous then and only then. But most people don't want to do that. They don't, don't, they don't want to really, and this is what it really gets down to because it's pride. I really don't want Jesus to tell me what to do and I, want Jesus, I don't want Jesus to run my life and I don't want to have to do what God wants me to do. I want to do what I want to do. Now, I'll acknowledge Jesus, and I know he loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Red and yellow, black and white, we are precious in the sight. They got that part down, but they don't have the part of surrender. They don't have the part of repentance. They don't have the part of giving your heart, your, the course, the direction of your life to Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. We think, well, I, I, I'll join church. I'll be better. No, follow me. That's salvation. That's life. That's fullness. That's abundance. That's victory. But that's, that's where so many people don't want it. The only way new victory comes is when we get the new headship. And we come back, even as Christians, if we've had a failure, we come back and get under that headship again. We realize, hey, my problem started when I walked away from the headship of Jesus over my life. When I quit letting him call the shots and make the decisions, then my life was ruined at that part. What you discover is that God gave them the strategic plan. You know what? When they followed it, it worked. But, you know, I've discovered that every time I really tried, chose to follow Jesus' plan, it always works. What happens every time I follow my plan? Just like yours. It collapses, doesn't it? It doesn't work, it doesn't fail. But how often do we keep coming back to this and don't get the lesson? I was talking with a guy last week and he was, he was talking about he didn't, want to, he, he didn't want to resolve an issue and he said, you know, I just don't want to deal with it, I want to take care of it. I said, well, you, then you might as well just live here the rest of your life. Because that's where it's going to be until you deal with this issue in your heart and life. You're not going to go any further. And so and that's where most people are. They're like stuck back in the wilderness. They're wandering around Mount Sinai, you know, for 40 years in misery. Not going forward, not enjoy. Hey, failures come, but we don't live at the failure. Now, the new victory leads us to something that's really, 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 you got that, right? Really important. See, what is that? 
Just the same lesson they had to learn at Jericho. Just because the walls fell doesn't mean the war's over. And just because the AI goes down, they, they had an opportunity from a, from a strategic standpoint. They're supposed to conquer the land, right? They had a real opportunity to, to move on at this point and seize the, the sector of land known as Shechem, you know, uh, and, and, and continue moving on. But they were given instructions by Moses before they went in the land to do something. That once they got past to those first communities of victory, when they got to Mount Ebal and they got to Mount Gerizim, which was the next geographical landmark, then they were supposed to do something there. It involved at this point, all right, you guys are in, but let's realize you never stop making fresh, real new commitments. You never stop going farther in, and you can't go farther in without the fresh, new, real commitments. Isn't that the way it is? Paul said, you know, it's from glory to glory. What in the world do he mean? I believe our life is like that. It, it is the journey, and today is, is, is a new phase and a fresh new gra moment of grace and God's glory. We're headed for glory, but we need to stay committed. And so it's, it's renewal of commitments all the time. In my marriage, if it's going to stay fresh and vital and, 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 and full and meaningful, there's this renewal of commitments we make all the time. Especially after failure, we come back to, to that renewal of commitments. Here, here's what the Lord gave them instruction. If you have your Bible, it's, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 27. There's about eight verses, and I'll, I'll read you a section of it, basically where this is what you're supposed to do after you go into the land. And, and Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I've commanded you this day, and it shall be on the day... When you pass over the Jordan unto the land which the Lord has given you, you shall set up great stones and plaster them with plaster. And you'll write upon those that plaster the words of the law. And when you're passed over, that thou makest, mayest go into the land which the Lord God gives you, a land that flows with milk and honey, as the Lord God your fathers promised you. Therefore it shall be when you've gone over Jordan, you'll set up these stones which I commanded you this day. But now he tells them, I'm going to tell you where to put the stones up. He doesn't say right on the other side, where's a little town called Gilgal where they camped out. He doesn't say in Jericho, and he doesn't say at Ai. He says, I want you to put these stones up at Mount Ebal, which is just after Ai. And when you get to Mount Ebal, you plaster these things, you build an altar unto the Lord, an altar stones, and you won't lift up any iron tool upon them. In other words, I don't want a fancy altar. <laughs> I don't want hewn stones. I don't want carved. I just want natural stones and plaster on the plaster. You build the altar and on that altar, he says, that you build with whole stones, you will offer burnt offerings there on the Lord your God and you'll offer peace offerings and you'll eat there and you'll rejoice there before the Lord. What was it? It's a, it's a renewal service. It's a renewal of commitment. It's a, it's a remembering of honoring that, hey, we've gotten this far by the grace of God. We've gotten this far by obedience. We could go ahead, but don't get in a hurry. You need to take time to remember all the Lord has done. You need to take time to refresh yourself. And what happens? I think the same thing that needs to happen in our life after even great victories. And you follow through scripture where there were victories and there wasn't these pausing moments to honor the Lord like, like Elijah on Mount Carmel. You end up with defeat again. And so he, he, he builds the altar. And by the way, our Mount Ebal, which is called this Mount of Cursing, was Mount Calvary, where Jesus was cursed where the altar was built, where our sins were paid for, where Jesus becomes the curse for our sin. And so at Mount Ebal, they build this altar and they, they don't use any instruments to work on it. There's, there's no human work associated with the sacrifice ultimately. It's a simple altar. No flesh can glory in his presence. Nobody's saying, well, I designed the altar, you know. Oh, well, I, uh, one of my names is on the stones, you know. We all put our names on the stones that we bought for the altar. You know, they put a brick on the wall or whatever. But no, none of that, all right. It's just the offering is made. And so we build an altar in our life. This is our place of surrender where we recognize again the grace of God, the blood of Jesus that covers us. It's, it, I believe it's part of that first John 1, 9. We confess our sins at that altar. We make sure our hearts are right with God. We surrender to God. And the second thing is that Joshua wrote the law on the stones, on the plaster. By the way, this was the fourth public monument that had been made. The first one was at Gilgal when they crossed over the river. It was a commensurate of Israel's passage over the Jordan. The second was at Achor, a monument to Achan's sin and God's judgment there. The third was at Ai, a reminder of God's faithfulness to help his people and they piled the altar, uh, the stones up there in the city gate. And the fourth is here, reminding them of their success, 
that came by the hand of God and by the grace of God and by their obedience to his word. So they build this altar. They remember the promises of God. Joshua stands up and reads the law of God. All right. And as he reads the law of God and he takes from Deuteronomy, the, the, the course of scripture, where it talks about the blessings of God and the curses of God. The camp of Israel is broken into two groups. One stands before Mount Ebal, which are side by side. And if you've been to Israel, you've seen these mountains. One is barren and one has got life on it. Guess which one's Ebal, the Mount of Cursing, all right? And as you, I mean, you drive down the highway, you see these two mountains. And, and it's, that's the, the Mount of Curse and the Mount of Blessing. The people stand in front of the mountains and every time one of the blessings from the law is read, the people celebrate and say, amen, praise the Lord. When the curses are read, the people say, amen, praise the Lord. They, re they remind themselves, hey, there's blessings of obedience. Now, there's also some reward for not obeying, but it's not the kind of reward that you want. So they take their place and they're, they're confessing. And this is, I think, we have right here, we have, we have the altar, we have the word being read, and then we have the confession or the confirmation of the word. In your life, in my life, When's the last time you got before the altar of God? When's the last time you remembered the, the curse of Jesus uh, that, was take, that he took upon himself for our sins and confessed your own sins? When's the last time you took time to just claim the promises and the blessings of God and remember the curses of, for, of sin and death and disobedience? They're standing there and they're confessing amen as the, they read from the law. Deuteronomy says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the word of God. I command you this day and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But if you turn out of the side of the way which I command you, if you go after other gods which you have not known, it shall come to pass that when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land where you're going to possess it, you shall put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Another passage of scripture. They, they just can't push forward. You've got to stop. And you've got to spend time with God and you've got to honor the Lord God and you've got to remember that he is your life, he's your strength, he's your source, he's your power, he's your authority. And so they're taking time, and this is such an important part, to reaffirm the presence and the power of God over their life. Now today, we stand between two mountains, all right? There's two mountains now. And some would say, well, it's Mount Sinai, the law, and Mount Calvary, grace. No, I, 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 let's go another direction. I believe it's Mount Calvary, it's a mount of cursing. An amount of blessing that we look forward to this day is the Mount of Olives. The Bible says that Jesus will come himself and put his feet down upon the Mount of Olives and it will split in two and he will walk down the mountain in through the Eastern Gate and take his rightful place at the, on the throne of David as the King of the earth. That's worth praising the Lord for. I'm ready for that blessing. This would be a good day for that. Wouldn't that be, that'd shake up your afternoon. I don't think any football games are going to be going on <laughs> when that happens. So this is, this is such a, you know, a, a simple yet strategic lesson, you know, a new victory, a new commitment, you know, and, and if the new commitment doesn't follow, then you just miss all that the Lord has for you. Where are you right now in your spiritual walk in life? Just kind of getting by, going through the motions, you know, it gets into that whole cycle of just walking around the wilderness in your defeat. If you have trusted, genuinely given your life to Christ, you don't have to live there. You don't have to live there. You're going to come there. There's going to be times when we arrive there, I believe. But you don't have to stay there. You move forward. You move forward by moving to the cross, getting your heart right with God, and then pursuing the, the plan that God has for your life, fulfilling his purposes for your life. And you, at that point, you begin to experience the power of God in your life. But if you don't, you stay where you are. Listen, I've known a lot of Christians who died just like that. I've been saved like longer than dirt's been around, I think. Forty plus years, I've known the Lord. And I've seen a lot of people in that 40 years never go forward. They had a crisis and never got past it. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. It's not the way to live your life. Would you stand with your heads bowed today? It could well.